from the RSNA. This is Radiology Imaging Cancer Podcast. I'm Dr. Bahar Atainia, an incoming R1 Diagnostic Radiology resident at the University of Pennsylvania and a trainee editorial board member at Radiology Imaging Cancer. In this episode, we're diving into the realm of prostate cancer imaging, exploring research, innovation, and much more with our esteemed guest. The reason that we chose this topic for today's podcast is because radiology imaging cancer is developing a special collection on prostate imaging, and it focuses on many different advancements in prostate imaging for cancer detection and management, And our guest today is renowned for her work in these topics. We chose to have this interview. We are very excited for you to share this experience with us and also get the chance to hear more about the field and check out our special collection. Topics of interest for this special collection include, but are not limited to, improved detection, new technologies, novel imaging probes, AI applications, and analysis of the prostate tumor microenvironment. Submissions for this special collection are now open. Please see rsna.org slash prostate imaging for all the information and to submit your manuscripts. Joining us today is Dr. Katarzyna Matsura, a distinguished professor in the Department of Radiology Oncology and Urology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Dr. Matsura is renowned for her work in prostate imaging, particularly focusing on MRI applications in prostate cancer. In addition to her clinical fellowship in cross-sectional body imaging, Dr. Matsura completed a postdoctoral research fellowship in artificial intelligence and earned a PhD in medical informatics. She has served in leadership positions in several national and international radiology organizations. Among many other recognitions, she has received teaching awards from Johns Hopkins, RSNA, and American Association of Women in Radiology. Dr. Matsura, thank you so much for being with us today. We are very excited to have you in this podcast. Well, good morning, Dr. Atanya. This is a pleasure to be here with you, and uh, I'm really thrilled to have this opportunity to share my perspectives, and thank you for inviting me. What inspired you to establish a specialized program in prostate imaging, specifically with MRI? And during your practice, what have been some significant developments you've witnessed over the years in this field? Well, early in my career, which started as a faculty member at the Johns Hopkins University, in the mid-2000s, the American College of Radiology Imaging Network, ACRIN, uh, was conducting a prospective multi-center study recruiting patients with prostate cancer to evaluate uh, an emerging technology at the time uh, for imaging prostate cancer, which was MR spectroscopy. I was interested in pelvic MRI and became institutional principal investigator for Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital. And uh, I was really looking into this clinical trial through the lens of multidisciplinary collaboration with my urologists, as the purpose for this trial was really to determine if there was any incremental benefit of combined endorectal Uh, MRI with MR spectroscopic imaging when compared to uh, morphologic imaging with endorectal MRI alone. And the goal was, of course, to improve uh, detection and localization of prostate cancer and use the radical prostatectomy specimens as a reference standard. So for this clinical trial, at the time where the urology community was very skeptical of the role of MRI in the management of patients with prostate cancer, I was able to get some of my colleagues enthusiastic about helping me recruit patients. And then through collaboration with pathology, we were able to work as a team to really learn whether there was any advantage of using new emerging technologies such as spectroscopy at the time. And in this specific trial, the uh, spectroscopy did not prove to be um, beneficial in terms of added value to the morphologic imaging, 
However, this collaboration that we established and demonstrating to my colleagues that indeed MR was able to detect prostate cancer and get them focused on imaging uh, was very important uh, because since that time, their skepticism has transformed into the modern era over almost a decade plus to really embrace MR technology with all the advancements that came later. And the most important of those has been introduction of diffusion-weighted imaging because that gained most attention in the late 2000s. And through the ability to assess restriction of water molecules motion within the regions of uh, prostate cancer, we were able to really look at the sort of new way of detecting prostate cancer through diffusion-weighted imaging and even correlate the tumor aggressiveness with the degree of restriction that was observed in vivo. And then on top of this, the dynamic contrast enhanced imaging uh, with its unique uh, way of looking at the perfusion within the prostate gland allow us to add to the standard morphologic imaging, to the diffusion-weighted imaging, this perfusion aspect of imaging in what is now known the multi-parametric MR imaging, which is the standard of uh, care now for the prostate MRI. So the transition through several new developments in the cellular level imaging, which can be delivered through MR, these techniques of diffusion and perfusion, we really added a quite important dimension. And through that transition, my colleagues in urology were really moving from the skeptics to those who were embracing the new technology and asking for more, and the rest is history. As we know, MR, multi-parametric MRI established itself with high level evidence as very impactful imaging modality. But another sort of breakthrough, I would say, in the field was addressing the complexity of this imaging data that comes from multiple parameters in MRI and having standardized approach for radiologists to actually interpret and report imaging findings so that we all speak the same language, in quotes, and also so that researchers can use some measures of outcome assessment based on what's known the PIRAT scoring system. And the prostate imaging reporting and data system, the PIRATS, uh, system in version two was released by the Pirate Steering Committee um, around 2015 and then was also upgraded to 2.1 around 2019 with the new scoring system. We've witnessed wide adoption around the world of this consistent, as we uh, are looking at, scoring system for interpretation reporting, and again, using the PIRAT scores in outcomes research that uh, help us really move the field forward. And again, my colleagues in uh, urology have many times expressed to me their appreciation for our community to come together and create uh, this consistent way of communicating imaging findings and they have learned to understand the PIRAT scoring system and really are thrilled that we have developed it and are using it. That help them manage patients in more consistent fashion. And then as we move through the developments in the field, we arrive at the important role of MR-guided targeted biopsy because that allowed us to detect more clinically significant cancers by sampling MR visible targets that are scored through the PIRAT scoring system as um, suspicious, and in the same time, overcome the limitations of historically uh, applied standard systematic trust biopsies that were overdiagnosing insignificant cancer. So, focus on MR guided targeted biopsy 
has really moved us towards detecting clinically significant cancers that matter in terms of patients' outcome and really influence how our colleagues are managing uh, their patients. So, of course, we arrived at the sort of spectrum of having multidimensional data sets uh, using the targeted biopsies. And we really need tools to be able to integrate all the clinical factors, the molecular diagnostics tests, the genetic text, tests that have emerged, plus the MR information that we can get from MR imaging, and to really build the predictive tools, and before that, to really have robust risk calculators. So I think the journey has been long, and uh, along its way, we found multiple avenues to create more opportunities for research and bring in evidence to really focus on the most important task that we have, is to detect and manage prostate cancer to improve patients' outcome. So I've been really honored to have participated in that journey to, till now. Amazing. That was very informative. And you kind of covered what I wanted to ask next. You kind of like continued the spectrum from how this is started and how the direction is going forward. I actually wanted to ask about the fact that you established like a close collaborative practice in your research throughout uh, with other specialties and with clinic side, research side, and the effects that that hold on patient care that you covered perfectly in your answer. So how do you see this continued effort, the collaborative effort affecting the field in the future? And do you see it still as plays significant roles, I assume? Well, certainly. I alluded to the importance of collaborations with uh, my colleagues in other departments. I hold joint appointments in other departments because we work so closely together. And that has helped us really move the field in our ecosystem here at Hopkins to embrace the new developments to which other clinical specialists waited for evidence before embracing the transition and translation. Uh, and we have been able to study and deliver the evidence to the point of even clinical practice. So collaborations are critical, both within our radiology community, through diverse talent that we have, both on the clinical and research side, and advancing these imaging technologies that I mentioned, and there are many others that are in the pipeline and, and will emerge. So the collaborations within the field between our sub-specialized researchers is so important. Inter-society engagements in our own field is also important as we translate uh, these technologies and most importantly, later disseminate these technologies. But uh, the clinical partners that I have worked with and the multidisciplinary teams that also come together to evaluate patients for their management uh, decisions is also important and very apparent through multidisciplinary conferences uh, that we hold when we discuss a patient's uh, uh, pathways across their prostate cancer journey from the detection through choosing and staying in active surveillance if they are eligible, through then managing them with appropriate therapies, being either a whole gland or perhaps a partial uh, treatment, ablative therapies that are emerging, and then managing patients who are suspected to have recurrence of the disease, patients who are suspected to have metastatic uh, disease, and uh, these partnerships really between researchers, clinicians, and industry are very critical because we need these backgrounds, different backgrounds in terms of knowledge base, and to shape the future of uh, prostate cancer care, uh, we need to address each individual level of the patient journey. And that, again, takes multiple different subspecialty training physicians coming together 
uh, with a joint purpose and discussing the evidence that's out there, thinking of the new clinical trials that are needed to answer answer the questions that are emerging during these conversations and also to address emerging technologies, how to prove that these technologies really can have impact and, of course, positive impact. That's what we hope for, for our patient care. So I cannot overemphasize the critical importance of, of multidisciplinary approach to everything from research to translation to clinical implementation and creating these pathways that are, as we call it today, precision type of approach to oncology, both on the diagnostic precision level, as well as the treatment precision tailored to each individual patient based on their risk factors, based on their risk classification, once all these different variables come together and then tailored specific to them treatment. So a lot of opportunities for us to innovate. And that is so exciting for the field and I think promising for our patients. Yes, amazing what we can do through all these multidisciplinary approaches and the perspective it brings. I think the future would be very bright based on what you described. Dr. Matsura, you brought up emerging technologies and you have a background in artificial intelligence. So how do you see these technologies intersect prostate cancer imaging? What potential do you think they have for improving patient outcomes eventually? Well, we all have been hearing so much about the artificial intelligence, the AI, and I already mentioned the precision medicine, precision oncology, precision treatment, where I think AI can play an enormous role because the whole concept of precision medicine really is based on incorporating a wide array of very large scale data. And that includes clinical data, genetic data, the new biomarkers that are uh, being developed and the imaging biomarkers and with the goal of stratifying patient into a risk category so then we can deliver this precision therapy that I mentioned. And AI has really demonstrated its sort of capacity, amplified capacity for data synthesis. So there are, you know, AI presents a unique methods and a unique opportunity for feature extractions from the imaging that would be on our side where we can develop new imaging-based biomarkers. And also AI allows this very robust, accelerated and multidimensional, I would say, data processing that we absolutely need for the precision oncology. And, uh, and we know that AI can facilitate image in quotes fusion, from different modalities. It allows this uh, integration of heterogeneous data. It can use many different methods, you know, in terms of technology that we don't need to dive into how AI actually brings this. But, you know, there may be multimodal networks that actually are able to combine data from different domains, right? Pathological data, clinical data, imaging data, genomic data, proteomics and other omics. And I really looking forward to new AI algorithms that will improve the prognostication for patients and, and will allow building these predictive frameworks for prostate cancer detection and even management, because that is something that is really at the center of our goal. And I also think for us as radiologists, we can look into AI helping with automation in certain workflows. It's been also shown to help with automation in workflows in pathology. And, and there's many more applications that, that we will learn probably soon. We also know about the developments in improving MRI quality. It's critical to the multi-parametric and specifically now bi-parametric MR 
that is really capitalizing on the power of diffusion-weighted imaging. We really need to control the MR quality tightly, and there is an opportunity for AI in that. And also as radiologists, diagnosticians, you know, there are so many steps in what we do where AI can help. It's already helping with gland segmentation, and there are systems out there for intraprostatic detection of suspicious lesions and even attempting pirates classification. So I do believe that AI really has a promise of empowering the clinicians to improve our decision making. But most important thing that's so hard for us to do in a timely and efficient manner, which is the assessment of, of really very complex, multidimensional uh, data coming from more and more different sources. So I believe that there is a lot of uh, promise along those developments, and there are already uh, systems out there that demonstrate that indeed these tasks and some of the efficiencies can be realized. But as with any new technology, we really need to considering the challenges that are brought uh, with the emerging techniques. We need to make sure that they are not only trained and validated appropriately, specifically including diverse cohorts of patients. Certainly, the large disparities do exist in the prostate cancer realm, where we know that both incidence and mortality from prostate cancer in black men is higher than those in non-Hispanic white men. Therefore, developing these tools also need to be focused on avoiding bias and making sure that the tools do study data coming from diverse cohorts of our patients. And the challenges of the prospective clinical trials are quite significant. We need those. We need the prospective approach to AI integrated clinical trials. And the integrated, in quotes, word is a challenge itself. How does AI fit and how will it truly help at the desktop or whichever uh, paradigm we're looking at in this clinical workflows, because this is non-trivial. The translation to integration into real clinical workflows to really benefit from these new techniques, that is a challenge in itself. There is need for interoperability and data exchange from this large-scale data that we hope to harness from the medical records. This data needs to be annotated patients' privacy needs to be protected. And uh, looking at the standardized approach, there has to be oversight, some regulatory pathway to approve safe technologies. And there are many components to these emerging technologies and their future successful implementation. But I'm hopeful, but there's a lot of work to be done and again, emphasizing the multidisciplinary approach to tackle individual components of the translation of these new technologies and patients' management paradigms. It's a necessity. It's at the core of progress in uh, prostate cancer detection and management and improving outcomes. Thank you very much for that detailed explanation. Looks like AI has a lot to offer if we can overcome all these challenges and continue to work on getting this more up and going toward the clinical research and practice. But this sounds fabulous if we can really get into overcoming these challenges that you mentioned. So around the same area, what do you consider to be the most promising direction for future research in prostate cancer imaging? And on top of the challenges that we discussed, what do you believe is the most pressing challenge? Well, I think the focus on biomarkers and prognostication is, is at the core of where we need to advance our research because patients come 
with questions addressing their clinicians, am I going to die of this disease? Or am I safe in active surveillance when low volume, low risk disease is found? So to be able to provide this individualized prognostication I alluded to this already about trying to integrate multiple multidimensional information and and multiple biomarkers from the clinical and, again, cellular level, genomic level, and imaging level to put this together to really have the robust risk calculators that can answer some of these questions to our patients based on experience, in quotes, of other men who have been in a similar situation in terms of their clinical scenario, their pathologic tumor grade, the extent of disease, many risk factors, the status of the biomarkers, and be very precise in telling them with certain, of course, uncertainty, but nevertheless, giving them the risk assessment so they can perform informed decisions together with their clinicians. So I believe incorporation of the multidimensional biomarker-based information into prognostication tools will help carry on these discussions with patients, and that is going to be very important. So That is something that we need to work. The work has been already implemented in certain aspects of uh, risk classifications that have been known for a long time, and certain there are guidelines that are based on those, but there is more that happens at the sort of precision level that we discuss that I think new tools and uh, computational tools can really help us with. So I think this biomarkers, prognostication, risk calculators that are up to date is one. Another one, I think focus on PSMA ligands. PSMA is the prostate-specific membrane antigen, which is a molecular target that has been demonstrated to be critically important on both the diagnostics side and also now moving into the therapeutic side with theranostics there has been a growing body of evidence supporting PSMA theranostics. And these approaches really optimize patient uh, management. And even there is a possibility that maybe one day we potentially will be able to alter the natural history of prostate cancer. That's really sort of long-term view. But molecular level imaging and PSMA is really an important a very promising direction that we are moving into and already see tremendous results. And on the treatment side, I also believe that as we talk about tailored approach to management that may include, again, active surveillance versus treatment, on the treatment side, I believe that uh, minimally invasive ablative techniques to address uh, localized prostate cancer, also very promising. And there is a lot of development in those technologies. So I believe that all these three that I mentioned really kind of center around the personalized diagnostics and personalized treatment. And I think that's something that will be amazing progress and will bring patients a lot of comfort for the decision-making in a very challenging situation of uh, being diagnosed with prostate cancer. Fantastic. Yes, that would be very interesting to get to see what future holds for these topics. Like Theranostics is a topic really near and dear to my heart. So I'm excited to hear that you're optimistic about it and the other two topics that you mentioned. So to kind of move on from the research You have a strong track record in education and mentorship. You've received many awards from the residents, from different societies. I wanted to see what drives your passion for teaching and how do you approach mentoring the next generation of radiologists and how do you think it's crucial to patient care 
in prostate cancer to kind of improve the patient outcomes. Thank you for for bringing this uh, very treasured recognitions that I received from trainees, both in radiology department, and I'm very passionate about uh, teaching my residents and fellows, and we work together as clinical teams and, and do some projects together. I try to offer them my uh, knowledge and approach to everyday diagnostics, and, and I'm learning from them as well because uh, they challenge me with questions and there are some topics we explore together. So I believe as an academic radiologist, now over two decades at the Johns Hopkins University, I've been thrilled to contribute to hundreds of residents, trainee, and I'm passionate about their successes, uh, seeing them move to both academic and private practice, develop new imaging pathways in those future jobs, and become leaders in radiology. So this, as I try to engage with them, I'm looking into paying it forward and seeing them succeed. It's wonderful. Being recognized by residents from my department of urology was really tremendous acknowledgement of how close we work. And I share my knowledge with other specialty trainees as well, also including radiation oncologists. They want to understand more about imaging, and I want them to understand more about imaging so that we can not only understand each other in individual patient management uh, situations, but also we can work together on many research projects. And I also need to understand the clinical questions that are being asked by the new generation of clinicians who are also challenging some of the old school, so to speak, approaches because they have a different perspective, different approach to using technology and embracing technology. So that has been really tremendous and brings me a lot of joy. And it's important role for an academic radiologist to assure that all the trainees that we get to work with really bring this foundation from imaging into their practice. So this Bidirectional exchange, it's something that has been very meaningful to me. Also, on the mentoring side, supporting and guiding my both trainees and junior colleagues has been also very rewarding because we need to maintain the continuity of excellence that, uh, that we uh, develop that can get to another level probably not even at this point imagined by us and the future generations are going to get us to this new exciting levels of technology advancement and translation that, that we are talking about. So, so this has been also quite important to me and I try to dedicate my time and support to advanced careers of my colleagues and sponsor them so that they can achieve visibility in their respective endeavors and, uh, and then they can be exposed to new opportunities. So our radiology societies uh, developing the mentorship-based relationship. It's a great contribution. The RSNA has done a wonderful job. Uh, AWR, the American Association for Women in Radiology, for which I was president in 2005, has embraced this for 40 years plus and uh, helping women advance in their careers. And American College of Radiology is working hard to develop and maintain the mentorship uh, relationships and develop pipelines for our future uh, generations of radiologists. So I believe that these are important endeavors that multiple societies and radiology departments have embraced. As an academic radiologist, I'm proud to have a chance to participate in, in these pathways. Developing educational programs for our colleagues in practice, it's another aspect of education. 
I've been involved with the American College of Radiology Educational Center, for which I built the prostate MR hands-on course, which we've delivered for eight years now. It's sort of simulation-based at the workstation evaluation of large number of prostate MRIs, where uh, we can discuss with this one-on-one faculty on site with individual learners, their challenges in terms of finding, detecting the lesions in the prostate, addressing challenges in techniques and discussing the quality of imaging, and most importantly, addressing some challenging clinical scenarios and developing the practice to help patients uh, get the best MR imaging they can get and get the MR targeted biopsies based on the MR imaging that will really define the true risk in terms of their cancer aggressiveness once the pathology is back from the targeted biopsies. Being involved in this educational endeavor with my colleagues around the country and even abroad uh, has been another quite rewarding experience for me. And we cannot forget patients. I think outreach, educational outreach to our patients is also critically important. And I've been involved in patient networks and sharing some of my perspectives, um, raising awareness in terms of what the MRI can bring to their management, answering their questions. And I know other colleagues of mine have been also reaching out through patients, um, advocate to this patient's network and being as patient focused as we can. So there is a lot of educational opportunities uh, for us in prostate imaging world. And I've been thrilled and honored to have participated in these different academic endeavors and reaching out to different colleagues and patients. I believe that's critically important. That was such a well-rounded experience in education in all different aspects. It's great. Dr. Matsura, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. This was very insightful. I'm sure that our audience will enjoy this as much as I did today. I really appreciate it. It was an honor to have you with us today. Dr. Atania, thank you so very much for inviting me. And uh, it's a pleasure in sharing my experience. Again, thank you for organizing this podcast Prostate cancer is a very important disease, and we know it's the second most common killers of men in the U.S. And sharing perspective on what an academic radiologist could do and contribute to the field has been an honor. So thank you for the opportunity. Amazing. Thank you very much. This concludes our episode. Thank you all for listening. Please don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast for more interviews with experts in cancer imaging. To explore our special collection on prostate imaging and more articles, please visit our website. I'm Bahar Atainia. This is Radiology Imaging Cancer. Till next time.